looks like it's running. Okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'm just going to jump right in because the first thing I want to ask you about immediately, Wendy, is, I mean, I fucking love the pamphlet so fucking much. I'm pissing myself laughing at just the brilliant language and I, I, I love it so much. But I wanted to ask you about Furfur because Furfur yeah. is, uh, is a goetic demon. Um, and I've had a little bit of truck with goetic demons myself. I wrote a book, the first book I was ever happy with, it's called The Comfort of Women. And I entered into a pact with a demon called Paimon, who's a fellow of Furfurs. Um, and the kind of deal was that I was trying to find a way of getting myself, you know, stop writing cliched novels, of getting myself out of the way a little bit. And I thought, well, if I summon a demon to help me write it, that will help me sort of get out of the way. And funnily enough, it was the first book that I was happy with as a book. And I kind of thought, I'm interested in your experience of even bringing up or conjuring demons because these little demonic complexes are very tricksterish and also they can lie a lot and they also, they always want something in return. It's some kind of pack. So my rationalization was, you know, if you write something with a demon, you've got to get it out there because then you let the demon have access to everything else and that's how the kind of pack pays off. In my, in my understanding of it, I'm interested, what was it like working with this furfur demon? Did you feel any of this kind of entity or presence? Well, I had looked at lots of, I thought, right, I need a demon here, so let's consult um, basically, you know, a few books and see what demon might suit me. Yeah. And so I was looking at, lot, I was looking at lots, lots of pictures, various different representation of demons, and I thought this, wee, this furfur one appealed to me. I like the idea that furfur was always lying that was yep. always telling lies all the time. So I thought that's, that's good. Um, and I kind of liked as well the whole idea of the triangle, you know, that it would keep on lying until it got in the triangle and then it would have to tell the truth in a low voice. I like that. Um, and to be honest as well, David, I just like the name because yeah. it sounds so innocuous, fur fur. It sounds so a, a wee cute. A wee yeah, cute it's like a wee thing, But it's yeah. not cute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and did you and have you found have you as as a uh, furfur had any effect in your own life? Because you know these demons can some kind of spill over and start actually fucking with you in your life, or have you managed to sort of contain them in the story? Well, you know, I am I am a big I'm a big rationalist to be honest. I'm maybe a bit of a disappointment here because I I am I am probably very very kind of from coming at it from that dimension but even even so there were little things that that there were little things that happened that i thought to myself that's that's weird that's weird i mean this sounds this sounds totally totally banal but there's a toilet roll and this toilet roll fell and rolled right and i couldn't believe it that this toilet roll could have fallen like this and i kept i kept trying to reenact it to see um, what angle this thing could have could have fallen at, so it would have rolled as far as it did, because there's no way this toilet roll could have rolled on its own like that. So I reenacted the falling of the toilet roll um, a few times, um, and I could never really get it. I thought to myself, wonder if that's that, wonder if that's that uh, fur fur. But you know, I like anyway with any of these stories. You know, I never really feel at the beginning that I'm in charge at all, and I like that. I like that vibe that you, you, you're sort of rolling with this and you're seeing where it's all gonna, you're seeing where it's all gonna go. Um, and I never really thought that at the end there would be all of these floods or there would be, you know, this big sort of good versus evil cosmic battle at the end and all the rest of it. So yeah, I, I, I enjoy doing it, but I think uh, that it belies a sort of uh, cuteness of the name for, for, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm like you, I mean, like, you know, I'm very interested in magic and stuff like that, but I am. I think it comes from us both being Tauruses as well. Like, we're dead earthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're dead, like, sort of rooted to the earth. We're not really into sort of high fancy ideas. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure if I believe in ghosts or anything like that, even, you know? But there's something about when you use, when you sort of um, enter into conversation with something else that's kind of not you. And you do have this experience. You're, you're touching on it there again. And it's something I very much have of the experience of, uh, of uh, having writing being dictated to you and it sort of mm -hmm. unfolds as you go. So do you start with a plan or do you just sort of write and then see where the story kind of heads? I don't start with a plan. And very rarely do I start with a plan. Most of the times when I start with a plan, I realize very, very early on the plan's been a bad one. Um, so yep. normally what I do is just, uh, this is the most enjoyable bit, just when you just totally go for it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first draft of something for me, I'm just, um, I'm just there taking it down and letting it go in whatever, whatever direction it, it, it wants to go in. And I find that really, really enjoyable. That's really, really pleasurable 
pleasurable thing because it's it's being revealed to you. And I know people could say, oh, stop getting on so daft about it. It's all you, you know, there's no need to try and make it out to be some sort of, you know, transcendental experience. But it does feel like that. And I know you can you can then bring other things to bear on it. But initially, I love that when it's just all telling, it's, it's telling itself. And I wonder, because I saw that, you know, it was it was written that it was channeled surrealist portraits. And I wanted to ask you about that word channeled, um, what what you were meaning by that, or what, what that kind of alluded to. Well, this has been my, honestly, this has been my experience ever since I sort of became a writer and was able to write novels. Uh, more and more, it feels to me like the, the texts are being channeled. And you can say it's all you, but then that, what is all you? What does you mean? What is this you? You know, to me, the you is everything you experience in, in, the, in the world, is every aspect of experience. You're out there as much as you are kind of in here. But when I began writing, when I write something like Empty Aphrodite or my novels or things like that, is they, they're, I cannot see how I wrote them because they don't really seem to come from memory. I, I, I never have the experience of inventing anything. I never think I'm ever thinking it up. It seems to be these things that somehow want to be spoken through me. And so my, I'm the sort of person that could never take, could never really teach a, a, a creative fiction class because I can't really describe, I can't really tell you how it works. I, I, I just know that I'm able to get, I have faith that it will transmit. When I sit down, I have faith that it's gonna transmit. And I have certain techniques for, that are close to listening. So for instance, I would, uh, when I was writing Empty Aphrodite, I would just literally, I, went, I was inspired because I went to uh, Nantes Cathedral and there was an incredible uh, 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 statue uh, carving there, a royal tomb, and it's surrounded on four corners by the fates, the fates, and they're incredible pieces of sculpture. And one fate is a woman who is holding in her hand a, a broken tower with a sort of fissure in it, and she's pulling a dragon out of it. And I love the ideas that fate, that literally fate, what happens to you, is kind of a gift or decided by another entity. And there's a hierarchy of fates that deal with different fates. So now I just wanted to roll with that and think, well, let's put an encyclopedia of all these different fates that can come to. So when I went to write it, I would literally have no plan whatsoever. I would sit down, and I would think, what fate is going to come to me? And then the word would come to me, so say, like, uh, pretend, patrimony, outrage, these kind of things. And then I would sit again and I were trying to listen to the voice. If that fate was speaking and had a character and how would it speak? And am I listening to it correctly? And it's kind of like dealing with demons as well, because in a way, you know, you need, you're talking about containing it in the triangle and things like that. And there's always yeah. things about interrogating and questioning demons to make sure they're not lying, as you said, or to make sure they're not, they're not false in a way. And so I would do that as well. I would listen until I felt that the voice was, was absolutely unequivocally the voice of that fate. And then I would start kind of dictating. And I don't, I write slowly because I only write down when I think I've, ex I've exactly got the voice rather than I'm inventing the voice or I'm making the voice up, you know? So I would just get in a sort of state of uh, receptivity and it would just kind of come. And when I read it back, it didn't feel that there was, I didn't have any feeling of sort of personal volition in there at all. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't mm -hmm. have that in my book. I don't feel like I'm guiding them at all. I don't feel like I'm, pushing them or forcing them in any direction. It's like, and that's why I love William Blake because when I got into William Blake as a kid, I know you're a massive Blake fan as well, we both are. And one of the things that I mis mistook in Blake when I was younger was when he would describe his books as prophetic, I kind of thought then that meant that there were books that somehow were telling the future. But what I realized is what he means prophetic books, he means by listening to the voice of now and taking it down, which is the voice of eternity, speaking through the moment. You know, and mm -hmm. I think that's why Blake's books are unfathomable. And I'm really into unfathomable art, art that cannot be, that is not there to be solved, art that you can't get to the bottom of. You know, the way that Blake's key figures mutate and t take on different roles and different powers and play different roles in, in different sagas. Um, it's, it's that energy and eternal delight. It's a system that somehow keeps energy alive, which is why Blake is as alive now as he ever was, because it was much more about channeling and transcribing rather than forcing himself into that. I thought Adam, to me, Adam, the, I, I loved Adam, right? The Adam fate, That's right? I was, I'll, I'll, go through all, I'll go through all my favourites because <laughs> I, I want to ask you about all my faves. Um, and that was, your, it's, that's got a bleak beat to it, Adam. Is that, yeah. what, is that what you were trying for there? Yeah, Yeah, I was trying to get that song right, Chloe. I mean, I, I know a lot of people hate it, but you know Alan Ginsberg's recordings of Songs of Innocence and of Experience? He's playing the harmonium and stuff and he's got that mad voice. I fucking love it. You know, I love his singing so much. 
fact, it does my wife's head in when I play that album so much because she, she, they're singing on it, it drives her mad. But I think Ginsberg perfectly captures that sort of gleeful, foolish, joyful song aspect that Blake has. And you're totally right. With something like Atom or something like that, I was trying to catch that thing where it's all, almost like a sort of nursery rhyme, like a children's rhyme kind of cadence. But within mm-hmm. this nice simplistic kind of cadence and rhyming, there's something of great depth. There seems something like elemental in it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I love all that. Um, the, the, the sort of simple things that are on surf on the surface, you know, great kind of uh, sort of spectacles of simplicity. But anybody with any intelligence that can can look at them can see that they're in fact incredibly incredibly complex. And mm-hmm. you know, they're k- kids kids can access Blake, kids can enjoy Blake. But you know, there's 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 all of that there, all of that crazy dichotomy, complexity, all the all the rest of it. Another one I totally love was forgiveness. Um, I thought that it was absolutely, um, it was absolutely brilliant that, you know, it was reminding me, and I know you've, you, you were referencing as well, Blake, and um, you were, you were, you were referencing there, um, Milton, Blake's, um, you know, Milton and so on. But to, yep. to me, that was like, um, that this one was just absolutely brilliant, that forgiveness was such a wimp. You know, forgiveness was oh. there. This yeah. little wimpy woman doing her, her, her jigsaw and, uh, you know, eating her margarita pizza. Yeah. Can you talk about that one a wee bit? Well, I just think there's something I can about... I was thinking about magic as well, magic and forgiveness. Now, people think that magical powers are often about everyone who ever... I was briefly a member of the OTO, Ordo Temple Orientis, Alistair Crowley, something. So it was, a, it was a nightmare. It was just completely dysfunctional. It was one of the least magical... Uh, scenes I've ever been involved in in my life, to be honest with you. But um, got a lot of good materials from books and things like that. And one of the things that always struck me was that every single person who ever joins a magical fraternity, like Crowley's, believes that their true will is to be this mm-hmm. massively powerful ubermensch that gets laid mm-hmm. all the time and has loads of money and is really successful. Everyone seems to believe that their true will involves that. And so some kind of stardom or some kind of major starring role in life. But I began to see the true magic. The true is... The true magic is just these tiny, simple things to know, to know the simple things that work for you. To think that maybe your fate isn't this huge, dramatic fate. There's something quite humbling and just to make the sitting around and making of a jigsaw, the simple pizza, these type of things as well. So people think that forgiveness is this big, huge thing. The devil, the devil needn't forgive. But forgiveness are these little tiny things, allowing these little tiny things and seeing in them the enormity and the magic of life as well. It's kind of what we're talking about in terms of these little, small details. And... That's what I always love about your writing as well, is because on the one hand, you're, there's such a sort of playfulness with you, with language and just the weird things that you notice. There's a, there is a sort of, you, you've got a childlike eye as well in the way that you spot mm-hmm. those things. I mean, even right at the start, I was like, when uh, Furfur is uh, on the top on top of the bus before springing onto the shelter, when he <sighs> kicked down a load of rainwater that garbed on the roof. Now, I would never think of a demon kicking rainwater off a roof. And it's just, you always seem to see things from like weird angles. You know what I mean? And always very funny and enjoyable. One of the other things I like so much, I mean, I have to be, I was absolutely killing myself for this, is we move on to the second story, Bright Gehanna. It's uh, when you start making up all these these, these stories about uh, We Jamie Divine. It, it, when you do this, go say it was called I See We Jamie Divine. I see We Jamie Divine down in 10 cans of Kestrel. I saw We Jamie Divine, sorry, down in 10 cans of Kestrel, then having a wank in his front garden. Well, I saw wee Jamie Devine shagging his man Gresham Street while he was eating a burger. Well, you know what? I saw wee Jamie Devine sucking Bobby Sanzi's dick while he was singing Jesus Loves Me and so on. <laughs> My favourite one is shagging his man while eating a burger. I mean, how did you think that up? I mean, I love, see, this is, I love getting, I love getting into these things in books as well. You can get away with being really rude and infantile and it's just so, but it seems fun and erudite at the same time in books. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, I just think of things like that non-stop all the whole of the day. Um, just all sorts of, you know, things we Jimmy Devine could be uh, could be doing. And then people meet me and they go, Oh, you're pretty boring. You know, you're you're not you're not as funny as I thought you would be. Um, but I'm always I'm always I'm always thinking of this stuff. I like what you're saying there about the the, the small aspects, you know, because at the end I knew at the end of um 
the um the first story that there's going to need a big cosmic showdown that it was going to mm. be good versus evil yeah. and what i wanted though i wanted good to be basically just trying to shore up really tiny little things you know yeah. kind of wee nicenesses here and there which is kind of like the equivalent of your forgiveness yeah. you know so good doesn't come in like you know god on a chariot or something or other yeah. um good good comes in as something really tiny like little kindnesses um and it doesn't seem it doesn't seem much to um to sort of shore up against against badness but it kind of accumulates to to something and i think that's it's so interesting i could all that stuff about you know magic societies and so on you know um i love that whole idea of you know the, and Dr. Faustus, which was another thing I was trying to reference in this, mm -hmm. is that whenever whenever Faustus is given the chance that he can, you know, he can see anything, he can do anything, he can experience anything in the world, mm -hmm. you know, he, he picks something like, oh, he wants to see Helena Troy to see how hot she was, you know, yeah. and a lot of her, a lot of her base desires are, are just pretty crappy really you know they, 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 you can be offered anything whatsoever in the world you know that you can see all of the great epic things throughout history and he's picking something like oh was Helen and Troy really that good look? yeah uh -huh. <laughs> so, well another thing that happened to me during the reading of that um I have a a, a relation who was diagnosed with a uh, terminal cancer and we'd all, we've always had quite an awkward relationship, didn't think I had much in common. And I could be quite I, I find myself being maybe quite critical of him before I found out all this about, about that he was actually dying. And I remember at first when, when I was talking to him and seeing what he was doing, and he wasn't really doing anything different. He was doing the same sort of stuff, the same sort of stuff that would annoy me that he did previously. And I would think to myself, my God, this guy's dying. Why is he not, why is he not going out and doing these incredible things? Why is he not traveling? Why is he not going yeah. to Why is he not having these great last experiences? But then I realized that actually, it is these little small experiences that are the beautiful ones. And actually, mm -hmm. if you were asking me what I would like to do, if I was dying of a terminal illness, well, what I'd like to do is just the same as I do every day. I just would like mm -hmm. more of it. You realize that these mm -hmm. big grand things are not really where life is or where love is or where happiness and excitement is. They, these, it's just more small little things, more little kindnesses, more little indulgences, more things that just sit mm -hmm. and walk up a tea staring out the window for two hours, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, so even, I wanted to write a magic book that was not all magic, you know I mean? But it wasn't all like robes and goatee beards and, and big canes and all that, you know what I mean? Because I always think the first, to me, the first, uh, the first key skill that a magician would have is invisibility. Because mm -hmm. if you imagine you want to move in the world. And if you announce yourself as a magician, then you walk in every situation, hey, I'm a magician. And you cut yourself, people react in silly ways. You cut yourself off from actually real magic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I always saw mm -hmm. that, like, you know, Alan Moore described himself as a magician. I'm like, why would you ever do that, mate? You've given yourself away immediately, you know? So I wanted to write, I use a sort of more sort of invisible magic. And when I talk about magic, I don't talk about you know, casting spells. That I was never interested in what they call results-based magic. I was just mm -hmm. interested in doing things that brought me closer or brought me into more intimate communion with the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. And these are in mm -hmm. invariably an ability to invest in small things are the things that take you closer to the magic of the moment. So yeah, I wanted it to be a magic sort of uh, encyclopedia, but I didn't want it to appeal. I don't want it to really be, I mean, I, I read a lot of stuff. I like reading Goetia and I like reading all these old, uh, magical grimoires and stuff like that because I just like language like you I love things like furfur and paimon I like how they sound in my mouth I like these barbaric words and sounds and I think growing up growing up I was quite religious I went to church all the time and I went to Sunday school and my mum made me and what 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 age did what age would you have like what age would you have started sort of questioning that at you know I can totally um, remember actually I can totally remember like probably late primary school I would say maybe I, I think maybe I was about 12 years old and I do remember saying to my mum saying look I need to have a serious conversation with you here and, and I need to ask you this question the question was does the devil exist does mm -hmm. the devil exist because I was pretty scared of the devil I was I was brought up quite religious and we went to this stupid Sunday school although I'm glad of it now because I, I like having a grounding in the bible and I still love biblical cadence I love that kind of fucking writing I love it so much you know but I was very very scared of the devil as a kid very, very much so. And when my mum said, honestly, and I was like, yeah, she said, there is no devil. The devil doesn't exist. And I was like, yes, yes. Because then I thought, you know what? None of it fucking exists. 
if one part of it's bullshit, all of it's bullshit. I don't think religion is bullshit. I think there are lessons, there are metaphorical lessons in there, absolutely. But biblical and religious literalism, I have no truck with whatsoever. ever. Moral commandments, I have no truck with whatsoever. ever. I, I, I like faith, faith in the rightness of things, and awe at the absolute magic of the miracle of consciousness, or whatever we want to call it, you know. But yeah, by 12, I was starting to do that. And then by like 14, 15, me and my mum were doing Ouija boards. You know what, because oh, yeah. well, my mum's whole thing was she, her, her thing was like, well, eh, it's subconscious. So it can only give you an answer if someone round the table knows the answer, otherwise it talks nonsense. So that was her anti-religious version of doing Ouija boards and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. did you ever get up to that? Because one, I know it sounds dumb and I never thought of it, but I always did want to recite the Lord's Prayer backwards, but I never <laughs> thought to actually write it out backwards so I could fucking read it. I would always be trying to say it. I mean, and I felt like such an idiot when I saw your, how you, that it had just been written backwards. And that's so easy. Yeah. Have you ever done that? Have you, did you try no. it? No, no, right. Because like, I would say I was... I would have gone to Sunday school, same sort of thing. I would have done all of that and we'd started, probably would have been questioning it from the point where, where you're saying, but I always retained, even whenever I knew this, even when I thought it was all, it just wasn't something that I was going to subscribe to, still sort of frightened of um, of the idea of the devil and so on. Yeah. Um, because nobody said to me the devil doesn't exist. Maybe if somebody had just categorically stated yeah. to me the devil doesn't exist, it would have been all right. But you know things things like that you know when i was growing up here there was just such a kind of there was just so much of that you know and um, the people were all sacrificing animals up on hills you know yeah. this was all of the talk and yeah. you know all this stuff about reciting the lord's prayer and you know i would have older members of my family would have been the glass they called it doing the glass and they got yeah, mr yeah. sheen out and the polish loads with mr sheen um so that this thing would apparently move easier and so on um, and they would sometimes they would be wanting me to do this glass um, Ouija board thing with them, but I, I I didn't. But I remember them telling me the things that they asked it, and again it was really banal sorts of things, you know, yeah. so and so having an affair with so and so, you know, yeah. it was all it was all secrets, mysteries of the universe, and so on. It was all about people that, in their locality, what what they were up to. Yeah, it was like cosmic gossip or something, you know. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And do you? I noticed that it said as well about. Um, you're a lifelong student of spirituality and religion and magic. And I thought that was lovely, life, lifelong, you know, you're into that for the duration. Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, it has, and it has had an incredible effect on me. It has changed me. And I, I can't really, I can't put it down to what, what key moments along the lines. But I mean, definitely um, get, get studying a lot and reading a lot of Christianity and a lot of mystical Christianity. And then I was very into Kabbalah. Was very into mm -hmm. the Zohar, the Bahir. I love all those those great Jewish books again because I just love the way they write. I love the rhythms and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but I think it was maybe it was writing that made me a true believer because that's where I developed faith. That's what I mean by I kind of have faith now that the voices come when they need to come, and I trust them, and I, I I'm able to get out of the way and, and let the books kind of write themselves, really. You know, it's just getting into a receptive kind of a, a spot. But I think definitely spirituality. Um, it taught me a lot. Definitely, Alistair Crowley definitely did. I'm not a fan of fans of Alistair Crowley. I don't really kind of hang around with like major Alistair Crowley fans, but Alistair Crowley's network, real, is is ideas were really liberating for me, and not in the terms of um the black satanic idea. I think a lot of his stuff is really kind of positive and quite beautiful. Like one of the things that blew me away and really changed my attitude was when the way that uh, Crowley redefines change as love. And he has this beautiful idea that everything is longing to be united with what it's not, which is the engine of change. And I just thought mm -hmm. rethinking change is love is fucking absolutely beautiful. That the whole universe is filled with longing. Every se separate aspect of it longs to be absorbed into every other aspect of it. What a beautiful idea for how the universe might work and how love might be an engine without... Uh, without it being sort of sentimental, without it being a soppy sentimental idea. And I think things like that were really quite major to me. And it's also beginning to meditate. I mean, I meditate a lot and I meditate for years and that's, that has a massive effect on me as well. But, and, because, and also doing the tarot, which I did for Rough Trade as well, because you start to realise that, and this is a big revelation to me, because talking about who you, you are, we were talking about that earlier, is you start to realise that actually most people, and most of the time you yourself, mistake who you are for your thoughts you actually mm -hmm. find the essence of you and the thoughts that are rising spontaneously in your head and to me that's just as mad as finding 
yourself and a sound rising in the back of the room or a, a scene moving in front of you. These things arise and they disappear seemingly of their own volition. And so I, one of my big lessons was finding my identity no longer in my thoughts, not associating myself with the thoughts, knowing when they can be useful and helpful, but knowing that they don't have any essential weight. They're not me essentially. And that ties in with writing. I then began to realize that the thing that was right in the book wasn't really me. It wasn't me. And I can just allow it to happen. And so my whole thing now is see when you start to feel you're squeezing your brain, you know, when you're writing, you're like, oh, I'm really mm. squeezing my brain. I just stop because I feel that's me then. I'm then using this kind of force. So stepping mm. back and allowing these books to be written by this voice is kind of like, it's kind of how I operate on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't really take the voices in my head too seriously, you know? Mm. And I think mm. as in magic, we talked about the triangle, there are banishing rituals to sort of keep these voices at bay. I do a verse of that. That's why I don't take notes. You know, I'll never take mm -hmm. a note during a date ever. Because that's just an excuse mm -hmm. for these voices, these demons to start talking to you. When you're trying to do mm -hmm. something else, I'll be like, mate, I'm gardening. If what you've yeah. got to say is of any interest and of any weight, then it will come back when I'm sitting down writing. And if it wasn't, then I'm glad I never listened to you. And I just have yeah. faith that what remains, remains. Yeah, yeah. But do you know, do you think, like, whenever I was, whenever I was reading, whenever I was reading this, one of the things that was I was thinking was that, um there's in terms of what you bring to bear on what you're right on what you are writing it's it's really rich compared to many other people i'm paying you paying you a compliment here david right it, there's david. all this stuff that's coming in you know caves in lasco so you're looking at you're looking at art and you're looking at really early art you know you're looking at vengeances like alan Vega. you know you're look you're looking at you know the philosopher the guy um alistair galbraith and bringing in music yeah, and so on works. do you not do you, if you're being honest do you not think that compared to a lot of people you're probably bringing a lot more aspects of life and experience and art and culture than than many others <laughs> i'll just say yes for that one yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> move on right yeah right it's, it's, next it's, question because yeah i mean i'm talking about getting out of the way but there a lot of the things you said there that's a lot of my obsessions like probably yeah. like Eva, totally mental about it gothic cathedrals alan vega suicide new zealand underground music you know but you know the point i always go back to the point of jack spicer because he's another guy that talks a lot about um transmitted text, received text, and things like that. And uh, he would compare, again, he said it's very difficult to get yourself out of the way. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But what, in fact, he would compare his writing to, he said it was like, one, he said it was like dialing across a, you know, a, a shortwave radio and trying to hone in on a signal. But he also talked about it, it's like Martians coming into a room with you and you give them these building blocks, these 26 blocks that have got the letters of the alphabet on it. And then Martians mm -hmm. are trying to communicate their language through our alphabet. So I kind of mm -hmm. think that these voices are trying to communicate through me and they necessarily need to use some obsessions because there's an energy there. There's some kind of energy in those obsessions that if they're able to use as some kind of matrix, matrix to sort of come through, you know what I mean? So there are certain things I think allow them or, or they allow me through my interests, they're, they're able to speak clearer or something like that. So there is something of it in me. But they sort of decide when these things are going to come up and when they're not, you know. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. odd, mm -hmm. I think. And it is an odd feeling. It is a feeling sometimes like, well, I mean, the definition of madness is like voices in your head. I mean, when you're writing a, when you when you're writing both of these stories, for instance, do you have, is it like living with voices in your head? Do you feel you're living with these characters the whole time the story is being created? Mm -hmm. And I like it. I welcome it. It's good. Yeah. So I mean, I'm working. I'm working on something else at present, and it's about a woman called Roberta, and um, I, I am just, I'm enjoying that. I'm, I'm welcoming that, but um, I'm just trying to get to know her. She's getting to know me. Yeah. And um, we're just, we're just working it, working it through. And I'm trying to think. Well, what would she find acceptable? What would, she, what would she, uh, what would she not? And to me, that's the most enjoyable part of the, of the process. Whenever you're, whenever you're working in, in that kind of way. You know? Yeah, but you can tell, I mean, your characters do feel real and I enjoy being around them. I enjoy hanging out with them and I love their patter and the way they talk and stuff like that. And that's what I like about my own characters as well is you, you, you do establish a relationship, you know, and you mm -hmm. get to know them and, you know, like, uh, like I've fallen in love with some of my characters and I wish I could see some of my characters again, but you can't make them appear. Do you ever have that thing where I would love if that character turned up again somewhere? I'd love to spend more time with them or... 
Yeah, oh, totally. Abs absolutely, that I'd like them to come again. There's like, there's this one guy, right? This isn't a character. This is an actual real, real person. And um, I've been trying to bring him, well, not, not this real person, but a version, like somebody with that type of vibe, that type of energy. And it was a guy that had a, a, like a machete attack and he um, lost his leg and then he used his artificial leg as a bomb, right? And so I've been trying to kind of think, I'd love to write a story about a person like that, right? And I've been trying to bring him in all the time, about four or five stories, and it's just never worked. So that's something that I'd like to kind of encounter again, imaginatively, and, and bring him in at, at some point if I, if I could. Yeah, but, but sometimes I'll... Sorry, Dave. Sometimes I think about some some of the people I've written about and think I wonder what they're up to, wonder what they're up to now and all the rest. But they, see the time whenever you know the Gil the Gil Courtney character from my um you know um collection stories, you know, um somebody somebody contacted me to say that they were doing some sort of presentation about this guy in Germany. Um, and I was like, oh brilliant, Gil's having his day in the sun, fantastic, you know. Gil's getting the credit he deserves and all this. And I was thinking, this is a fake, this guy doesn't exist, you know? So what are people talking about him in Germany? Um, he's not He's not real, but he kind of is at the same at the same time. Also, I mean, wondered, sorry, you go on. I was going to say, like, like, these characters, like when you send out Satan who's real, I feel as if these characters then go on and have their own life and their own relationship with other readers as well. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. kinda, it's like a child in a way who leaves home. And they go off and they're going off to have these adventures. And you, I totally agree. I do sit sometimes and wonder what my characters are up to, whether some of them are still alive, what became of them then. But of course, the only way to find out would be to write it. And even when you mm -hmm. write it, as you said, there's no guarantee they're even going to show up, you know? That's right. That's right. That's right. Totally so. And what was it? How did you... Um, you've, you've worked before with, um, with Sophie, who was illustrating um, your, your book. What was that like? Did you... Did you have any input into what you wanted her to use for the illustration, or was that a total surprise to you? Well, I wrote the descriptions first. Like um, when we did the tarot pack, what I would do is I would write a description of a card, and then I would track. And then and Sophie and I would have a back and forth. She would ask something or say something. I would say something else, and she'd kind of get an idea. Um, I think we mm -hmm. worked so well and so easily on that tarot thing. It was just really intuitive, and she'd come back with stuff that would blow me away. I really felt mm -hmm. we again, she had an intuitive understanding of sort of tarot. Really, really great. So for Enter Aphrodite, it was even easier. I wrote the entire, uh, uh, the entire uh, encyclopedia and handed it over. And then she just did the art based on each single entry. It was as simple as that. And when she sent them over, I was like, yeah, this is it completely. And I loved the whole like sort of Panini uh, sticker book kind of feel. Because I mean, I collected stickers when I was growing up. I had all the football panini books and shit like that. And I love that kind of style. You'd be swapping them in the playground and shit. So I love that kind of approach, you know? Yeah, I've got... Right, so I stuck the stickers on my phone. So I covered my phone with them. Oh, um, and I also stuck them on my diary. So I don't have it the hands here, but my diary looks really well because it's got all the stickers on the front and on the back. Okay. Um, and they've kind of worn off on the phone. But kind of like that too. Nice. The fact that they're all, they're all wearing away. Yeah. Oh, and I was also going to ask you about your, I mean, you're, you're also have a recurring obsession about sort of weird uh, show bands and, and groups and things like that in Belfast, of which there was a whole subculture of. Where did that fascination come from? I kind of share it myself. My father actually managed a guy who was a bit of an inspiration for one of my books, for the good things, a guy called Al Logan. And uh, he's very much of that, up, up that kind of route. Songs are very Catholic, a little bit, a little bit religious, a couple of, Como style crooners and stuff like this. And oh, we would make my dad's life a misery because he's, of course, he's on the front of the album with his baby daughter in like a death grip, you know. And we'd always be like, Dad, that guy's a fucking pedo. Why are you working for him? All this crap, you know what I mean? But I, I always pick up any weird, like show band or religious or folky or croony records that are private press from Belfast in terms of that because it is a fascinating milieu. So, how did you get into all that? Don't know. I suppose like we were like my my household was not like a musical household at all. Like we had probably had like my mum and dad had about two different two albums and that was it. But they would have listened to the radio constantly, and so I would have heard a lot of that stuff on the on the radio. I remember it dawned on me all the show bands. It was all covers, and I remember you know thinking, why do these people never write any of their own stuff? Why are they just always doing all these all these cover versions and yeah. so on? And then um, I just. I remember as well working in a record shop 
and a rep for one of the it was like whenever I was imagining the little music label and the record label in the Bright Gehenna story um, I was kind of imagining this guy that used to come into the record shop where I was working for a while and he was like a he was like a rockabilly um, but perfect you know perfect it looked absolutely like he had just just come out of the 50s and he came in with all this show band stuff um, because that was what the, and it was just such a it was just such a weird kind of mixture of um of things and i remember one time seeing him out with his girlfriend and she was like a sort of marilyn monroe style pin up you know wiggle uh -huh. skirt style she was just per central casting basically yeah. the whole thing was central casting you know um and just all of all of that people with these wee labels and you know trying to do this country gospel and it's just the sort of thing as well to be honest you would see in all the second hand shops around this road where i live you know if you go and look it'll be all of these not Re reverend william mccray like he's the most sort of well known of, of yeah. these people but you know there'll be there'll be other ones uh, there'll be other ones too and i suppose i've just always found it really funny too people singing about god when they're not singing about god when they're really singing about sex so they're singing about about love or whatever you know it's yeah. kind of like acceptable for them to be singing about god but that's not actually what it is yeah well i mean you always make me when i think of, of your belfast of wendy erskine's belfast and say <laughs> it was way with that as well i always think it's like a belfast of kind of seedy glam <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> which is another quite which it's there it's definitely there i've experienced that in belfast myself but you really bring that to the fore and i think it's one of the things i really, I, I love about belfast is that cd glam is that get up and give us a song is these great is these people being good chanters and stuff you know yeah yeah well i mean i suppose like it's like any city there's hundreds of versions there's hun there's hundreds of competing versions of any city there's hundreds yeah. of competing versions of any of any person, I suppose you could say as well. But yeah, I like the old CD glam. Um, and so I'm going to seek that out wherever I go. And, you know, <laughs> even if you took me to some super classy joint, I would still be looking for the old the old CD aspect to it, no matter how high end it was, you know, I don't I don't know where where I'm thinking of, but no matter where I would I would find it. So that's why I love for the good times, because you get that. I mean, the whole Europa and all the rest of it, I just adore it. Yeah, I was thinking that time you and me were in the Europa. That's another example of the sort of CD glam, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't it's think. So I don't, did we get to the? Did we? Did we actually find out when you found out the scene wasn't real, or have you? Have you not found out yet? Well, logically, <laughs> rationally, I know he's not real, but you know, it's still. Uh, still exerts a little bit i mean i would i would i would still see if i was watching a horror film and so on i can probably couldn't do that by myself i would still really? uh yeah you still get scared, do you? yeah i would still get scared i would i would totally I mean, so. I'm, I'm not so bad now but i definitely was as a kid as well i was definitely i, I remember the first time my mum said that we could stay up to watch a horror movie and it was actually mm -hmm. a sci-fi movie it was i don't know if you've ever seen it it came from outer space you know that's a 50 no, white no. one 50s black and white. I mean, it's a, a, psych, a psychotronic type B movie. So we got the the black and white. So mum was like, okay, we're staying up to watch our first horror science fiction movie. So we all put the TV on and then the credits start. And it's like a sort of weird wobble. You're seeing it out of an alien's eye. And it's like all sort of Vaseline. And there's this weird music. It's just going, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's this alien eye that you're seeing out is walking down the road. And that was enough. Me and my sister were just like, no! And just totally belted it out after that. So I couldn't even sit through that. It took me a long time myself to be able to, watch horror and science fiction movies. Although at the same time, I was kind of like, had that attraction to it because I was attracted to stuff that disturbed me as well. Like I mm -hmm. remember like, there was a magazine called The Unexplained. Do you ever remember that? It was a, yeah, like, I do. Mm -hmm. oh, it was amazing. And it came out every week and then you could get a binder where you put all the issues together. But then they had articles on things like spontaneous human combustion. It was totally <laughs> fascinating. Now, in fact, I've got a book where, where there's a lot of spontaneous human combustion happening in it. But I also remember this one thing, man, that just to this day, I just could never bear to sit through it. And well, one of the early issues of the unexplained, they had a flexi disc. And it was supposedly voices from the dead. A guy had gone to a graveyard with like contact mics and had recorded things that sounded like voices coming from graves. And when my mum and dad were, weren't in in Airdrie, I got the flexi, put it on the stereo and played it. And honestly, it was so frightening. It was so, really? I can remember it to this fucking day what the voice sounded like. I was so scared that I went out in the back garden, I put it in a bin and I got some matches and I burnt the flexi disc. But I was so freaked out by it, you know? 
It's so That's weird that you and me were both so kind of scared with that type of stuff. I remember, yeah, being genuinely terrified. And I had to exercise it by destroying it, you know? Yeah, I remember I had like a... Um, Oh, I had loads of stuff. I remember I wanna. I had to tell a joke on the radio. I phoned in, you know, on these like phone ins, radio phone ins, right? So I I phoned in and told this joke. Um, it's called Junior Jokers, and the joke was the joke was why did why did the man set fire to his jacket? Answer because he wanted a blazer, right? So that was my that was my rubbishy wee joke, right? But I won the prize. So you imagine how bad the others were. And my prize when it arrived was an ELO single, Wild West Hero. Right, and like I just played it non stop. Right, I thought it was, I was only about, I don't know what age I was, nine or something. Like, I just absolutely adored it. And then, whenever people, whenever there was that whole thing about oh, ELO, like so innocuous, ELO, we're meant to be doing all these secret messages, all masks, yeah. and so on. People, I was like, oh, I got, I won a competition, and they sent me an ELO single, and um, BBC Radio Ulster. I was like, oh. God, why did they send you that? You know, of all of all the bands, why did they send you ELO? They were trying to get into your mind and so on. So I think that like I had a mate lived in Shetland and like he said that at one point, um, same sort of time, they were all into heavy metal and everything. And the local minister said that, you know, this was all Satan's work and whatever. They would fill this pit with cement. So they did chuck all their denim jackets in, had to chuck all their records in, all their badges, and this would all be covered in cement. I actually used it for like bright Gehenna, like put in a wee detail yeah. um, like that. And of course the cement didn't set and this was taken as like, oh my God, that's the devil. <laughs> the devil wouldn't let the cement set. You know? I think it's kind of in some ways it's quite, people like to feel that their lives, even though we're saying that the, the, the sort of like the meaningful things in lives are, in life is, is mundane or are mundane. People at the same time like to feel they're part of this cosmic battle. So you know, it's not just the cement didn't set because it was crappy cement. The cement didn't set because Satan didn't want it to set. You know, yeah. elevates elevates your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think maybe it's also something that to do with the generation that we are. I think like I feel when, like growing up in the seventies, we were under like a permanent sort of siege of terror. I mean, there was all yeah. that for like. Dying of hypothermia, uh, getting bitten by a rabid dog, having to build oh, yeah. a, a shelter with a door in case yeah, you nuclear, there. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a yeah. year of kind of cultural terror, and, and sometimes I feel a strange nostalgia for that kind of terror in a way. Yeah, I've tried to tell my kids that you, you, you can't, you cannot, you, you can't imagine what the fear was like. You know, our poetry book in school had a mushroom cloud in the front of it. <laughs> it was called uh, Touchstones. And the image in the front of this thing was this just massive mushroom cloud. And there was a whole section in the book on sort of basically Armageddon, you know? And that yeah. was what that was yeah. what kids were learning about. Yeah, it was a reality that you were living through. I can remember as a kid coming down in the night and crying at my mum and dad and saying, well, there'll be a nuclear war. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of mad. I mean, people think like this crazy times, 2020 is crazy times. But you kind of realise there's never a time when things aren't crazy. The 70s were absolutely mm -hmm. crazy. There's not a nuclear war going to happen at any kind of moment. You know, there's always mm -hmm. this kind of absolute madness there. But I think somehow the culture was maybe more, um, it seeped out any other aspects of the culture, whether it was comics, books, TV, films, all this stuff. I've had a really macabre kind of uh, atmosphere from that time. And, it, and that's definitely something that has been a big influence on me. You know, just all, all like, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the ghost story books that people like Peter Haining would compile these ghost story books and stuff, and you get them at the library, all these weird covers. I mean, that. Some of the first stuff I really read was probably like ghost stories and monster stories and science fiction and supernatural yeah. stuff, you know? Yeah, there was a magazine, uh, there was a magazine called Misty. I don't know if you've ever oh, heard yeah, of this magazine. That. Was that a, it was like a comic, uh, yeah. yeah, called Misty. And it was kind of sort of, you know, the unknown, uh, unexplained, you know, magic. And my mom wouldn't, my mom wouldn't let me get it. And so, you know, she'd get me a comic every week or, or magazine. And I would say, oh, can I get Misty? And she's like, no, not Misty. Wow. Uh, and then, but even the name, Misty, square, isn't it? I know, because it was always a sort of young girl running away from like a, a fog covered graveyard or something, you know? What That's I mean? right. That is all purple. It's always like mauves and purples yeah. and graveyards. Yeah, absolutely. What, totally comics, so. what comics did you get? Bunty. Um, it was it was DC Thompson. Bunty was DC Thompson, right. I think. Right. Um, yeah. And what else? Did I get Jackie? I got Bunty, I got Jackie. Um, yeah, they were they were good. They were yeah, good. I used to get my grand would get me Wizard and Chips, uh, Dandy, Bino, 
Uh, and then I began getting into like battle action and mm -hmm. then uh, Star Lord and then 2000 AD. And again, like 2000 mm -hmm. AD, those comics, that was a massive thing for me. I mean, we were talking about Alan Moore earlier on, but certainly we did early Alan Moore comic strips and stuff like that in 2000 AD. That was another major thing for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause and my grandma would always have them in her pantry. So you would open the pantry and on a little shelf and you'd smell the pantry. And I can still, every time I look at these comics, I can still smell the smells of my grand's house. You know, like after mints and like a sideboard and shit like that. You know what I mean? Sorry, did I say after mints? After eights. After eights. <laughs> after eights. I always think of minty sideboards when I think of my gran, you know what I mean? Yeah. I remember my my gran used to um she had this it was actually really sinister this this thing in her hall it was like a great big carved I don't know what you would say it was like a it was like a big wooden carved um seat um with a kind of like a it looked like sort of a terrifying sort of I don't know sort of African carving thing but inside it her next door neighbor gave her all copies of News of the World and the Sun so that she could then give them to her church because they in some way recycled these things so uh, or used them for something so I'd always say can I go to that seat and get out the News of the World and the Sun so I would just sit nine ten years old just sit and reading the News of the World it was Pretty good, really. Yeah, that's think. definitely going to be an education age for sure, man. You know. Yeah. Last totally. thing I, I mean, this is unrelated, but um, did they have? Did you find porno mags in fields in Belfast? Because that was it. That was a thing that was always happening in Airdrie. If you went up to the fields, there would always be big mounds of porno mags, like under trees or behind fences and stuff like that. So this weird association with like the wilderness with like porno. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, there would have been that kind of thing. Um, and um, I can remember um. Even in school, I remember somebody stuck up a, a porno mag in the, in the lockers in my school, well, a page from porno mag, and just like people just found it so terrifying. I could just remember people looking in sort of shock, you mm. know, because it was a scary thing rather than rather than anything else. Yeah, I remember. Lockers. Yeah, I've been down the fields and some guys, we were playing around and some guys on motorbikes had stopped and then drove off. And we went over it where they stopped and they'd taken like a porno like center sped and they'd hung it on a wire fence. I mean, my kid, I mean, we're just like, ah, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, it's completely. Imagine. You know, I can imagine. Wild. Totally. But there was something about being out and encountering these things at random that was kind of exciting and weirdly educative and like just made you think, fucking hell, the adult world is just up ahead and it's completely mental. You know? Yeah, to totally. Yeah. Just little, just little things like that that you get a little glimpse into. Uh, another world that you don't have access to yet, but you can kind of get a peep into for sure, totally. Yeah. What do you think, Wendy? I don't even know how would. Well, I think we were done low. I think that was brilliant. I loved it. I think that's really good. Yeah, it was like good timing actually. Brilliant, awesome. Okay. Brilliant, brilliant. I never listened to that guy. I've been listening to him now, um, the Galbraith guy. I never listened to him before. He is the fucking shit, man. Did you listen to Morse? Did you check out that album? Yes, yeah, so that's what I did. Yeah, so I listened, I listened to that. And I actually ordered it to come as well. Um, so I thought that was absolutely brilliant. It was great. Oh, because wow. the way you said the philosopher, I actually thought, right, okay, he, this guy's the philosopher. And then I looked him up and I realised, no, he's not. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I love brilliant. Just brilliant. Oh, that's awesome. That's really, really cool. Yeah. I love, are you into New Zealand stuff? Do you like that sort of flying nun? No, I don't know. I don't know anything, anything about it. Nothing about it. I need to do your playlist. The best shit. Yeah, do. God, I'd love that. That would be brilliant. That music changed my life, all that New Zealand underground stuff. For such a tiny country, it's just completely fucking crazy the amount of brilliant bands here. There's one band, have you heard the Pin Group? No. That's kind of, they're another band that I kind of a wee bit memorial, I can imagine memorial device sounding like a little bit. So mm -hmm. Let me put you together a comp then, I'll do some pin groups, some go brace, some this kind of punishment, all that kind of stuff. It's so good. Brilliant. brilliant all right, that's Wendy. Well, um, wonderful to see yeah, you. Absolutely yeah, brilliant. Yeah, lovely to have that conversation. Oh, it is. And yeah, I totally love it. And it's real. It's, I was honestly, I just love Oh, loved well, it. no, I love this. I thought it was abs I thought it was brilliant. But right, I've looked up, honestly, see off the back of it, there's so much stuff that I've gone away and read about. You know, the Lasco thing. Been yeah. reading loads about that. I mean, it's just so. It's just so much stuff in it. It's just. It's just brilliant. It really is. I went down those. I. I. We went there when I was about thirteen, and I broke my leg. And my dad was like, "Well, you can down these caves, broken leg or not, you know." You went to. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Did you really fucking hear? I've never been. What was it like? Yeah. 
It was cool. It was really, it was really, really, it was really cool. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, and we went to other ones as well that didn't have art, but they were still, they were near, just they were very, very near and they were, they were cool like, but I'd like the best arms ever because it was going around in these old crutches the whole time. So uh, probably the most muscly arms I ever had, but yeah. Because <laughs> I'm 25. But listen, it's Sorry. been brilliant to speak to you. Oh, it's been great, Wendy. We're all really fantastic. Probably going to catch up. We'll stay in touch. I'll get us across to uh, Nina. I'm sure she'll need to edit it or something. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm sure you made a better job of it than me. All right, awesome. All right, Wendy. What's okay. a lot? Cheerio. Yeah, bye. Bye. Bye-bye.